Okay, so we're good to go. So this is um, certainly one of the most prominent, most well-respected endodontists in the world, Dr. Arnaldo Castellucci. Um, we're gonna talk about how you got into endodontics, but I wanna meet your child. Can we meet your child? Is Sandra still there? Yes, it's here. Okay, so this is Arnaldo's child. This is beautiful, beautiful partner. Uh, Sandra, ah, what's his name? Romeo. 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 All right. Is he, does he behave like Romeo? Has he got a Juliet? <laughs> not, not, <laughs> yet. Yet. not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So it's okay. I was, we were talking about uh, where you travel. So you were saying you go to Vienna, you love Vienna. Um, but you have found a second home. If Italy stopped being, in, if there was no Italy, you would be living in Polynesia, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And Bora Bora. So exactly. we'll talk about Sardinia in a moment, but talk to me about Polynesia. You decide you want to go visit it. You go there for a couple of weeks, and all of a sudden, Italy goes away. You don't remember it. It goes into <laughs> history books. It goes into the clouds. So what, what entranced you about Polynesia? What was that all about? What, what made you so happy? <clears throat> well, the, the atmosphere, the weather, the temperature, uh, the sun, the beach, the, the color, people. The, people, people. the color, color the of people. water. Yeah. The color okay. of water is like my, the, the same color like this, mm -hmm. from this very light blue to dark blue. And then I went, we went uh, scuba diving together. Mm -hmm. And the instructor of scuba diving, uh, you know, the Bora Bora is a big mountain oh, yeah. in the middle of the big bay. And if we go uh, next to the entrance to the, of the ocean, now the dolphins come oh, yeah. and the instructors start swimming. In With the dolphins. Movement. And yes. the dolphin came, <laughs> came and I have pictures of uh, the dolphin very, very close to me uh, swimming yeah. in underwater. And then there, once you have your a, a t-shirt and, and a swimming um, bikini, a bikini or, or a bathing suit. He, he was in a bikini? <laughs> no, she was. <laughs> but that's the only thing you need because uh, any season of the year, the temperature is exactly the same. Wow, unbelievable. It's beautiful. And I'm, I, looking, I love I'm looking at him. I'm looking at his face and he just, the smile went from here to here. <laughs> Unbelievable. So you said you would live there. How would, what would life be like in Polynesia? What would you do? Go fishing, enjoying. Okay. Yeah. And that wouldn't, given how busy he's like, works like crazy. I mean, you know, his institute, his practice, his lecturing, his books. Um, do you think he could just stop? No. Oh. I, no. I, tell you i cannot you can't do that that's why polynesia remains the dreams and i'm still here <laughs> okay now in the summer when europe shuts down in august like the world just stops in europe you go to sardinia so yeah. that's a magnificent place you're near the beach so what do you do for a month in sardinia hopefully you're not writing books right that's not happening uh, no, yeah. no 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 yes <laughs> uh, what yeah last summer yes yes Okay. For the last maybe three or four summer, <clears throat> that's the best time. We we had a, an agreement, mm -hmm. okay. So she can sleep in the morning as much as she wants, okay. And then uh, I wake up a little bit earlier, and then I work with my computer. I have mm, my desk, my printer. I have everything like a second office. And then <clears throat> we have breakfast together later and then we go to the beach together then we have lunch maybe in the afternoon she wants to go back to the beach i stay at home to work a little bit more and that's it so do you cook at home or do you go out to the restaurants because i know you like to make steak right yes uh, he's a barbecue wizard yeah exactly yeah in our summer house we have a, a, a terrace <clears throat> that where, the, where it's like another room because we can have breakfast, lunch, dinner, and of course I have a very nice, well-organized barbecue. Okay. So I I cook fish, steak, whatever I I can find, and uh, 
Does he go fishing for the fish? Like, can you go fishing and catch the fish and take it home? No. No, no. no. I have a very good friend of mine who is an expert fishing. Okay. And so when I, if I want to go fishing, I go with him. Okay. <laughs> and then he, we eat the fish together. Do you know who Bobby Flay is? Does that mean anything to you? He's a very famous American chef who barbecues. That's uh -huh. what he does. He has a great cookbook on barbecue. So for Christmas, it's called Bobby Flay, F-L-A-Y. Oh, okay. You can get it on Amazon, I'm sure. You can get uh, anything on Amazon. You can buy the world have, on Amazon. I have many books about barbecue. Probably I have <laughs> Really? Is, I don't remember the name, but um, <clears throat> many of my books are printed by um, Weber, the, the company who makes... Uh, oh, they print, yeah, the, the, the grill. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yes. So we, you travel, you, uh, so, oh, the traveling, hold on for a second. Um, 56 countries. Yes. Mm -hmm. You have been invited to 56 countries at over the years. Once. Yes. The, just <laughs> once. Okay. But no, you, no, at least once. Oh, at least years. once. At least I once. I've said many, many times. Fantastic. And so you're traveling sometimes you can go with sandra sometimes not right? right yes right so when he goes traveling and he goes to lecture you visit the city and okay yes. so all your friends take you out it's it's a community right yes yes i, I lecture enjoy. I, enjoy. I lecture and she goes around visiting and taking pictures <laughs> so when when we meet back in the room hotel room now I see the picture and now I know what I'm, I've been missing. Ah, okay. I, I know very well the airport, the street to the hotel, the, the hotel room, and the, um, uh, the room of the lecture, the of the meeting, and back. She is it. the one who knows everything about the place. Yes, yeah. I took so, the tour and... Yeah, so you're the tour guide. Yeah. You tell them what he missed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> So we were together in Toronto one time, Gary Glassman, uh, we organized, a, um, he had a lecture in Toronto, right? And so you went to Niagara Falls. Yes. And that was, you loved it there. It was an amazing time. Amazing. Yes. Lovely. Not, not only the Niagara Falls, but also the guy took us to, a, a, I don't remember the name, but there's a little um, village, or village little, a little, little town, town, old town. Okay. Right? Typical from uh, that area. Okay, interesting. Was, was very very nice. So I want to talk about your textbooks because the one on your behind your right shoulder is seven years in the making. So we have John Engel who writes the first amazing study, the first amazing textbook. Um, we have Burns and Cohen who are now into their what I don't know tenth edition or something. Uh, which may be 10th or 11. Uh, 10th or 11. So now it's Ken Hargrave and Stephen Cohen. Uh -huh. And then you're watching all this and you decide you want to go to the top of the Dolomite Mountains and you're going to bring down three books. Endodoncia, which now gets translated into English. Yes. So seven years before this is published, you wake up one morning and you say, I want to write a textbook, right? Just, you're, you're no. having your breakfast no, and almost. you just, so, so what happened? How did this come about? Let, let me tell you what happened. Uh, it happened that uh, I had the idea to translate from English into Italian. <clears throat> Already existing a very small but very nice uh, textbook about endodontics. And while I was translating for the, in, in Italian, uh, uh, editor, uh, this textbook, inside of me, I was thinking, well, this book is nice, but I have so many more things to say and, uh, and things to show that after I published, uh, I translated this textbook, I had the idea, I want to write my own textbook. And so I started, uh, it was 1987 that, that I started to write <laughs> the first three or four chapters, starting from embryology, pulpopathology, radiology, and so on. <clears throat> it took me 
when you say it took me seven years, actually were seven months of August. Because seven months the, of August, okay. Seven, year, seven years of uh, no vacation, but uh, I was happy like crazy being in my private office at home in August, very hot, air conditioning, all my books uh, around me, and, uh, and I start writing. During the, the following months, I was updating what I already wrote, looking for the cases and pictures, and then the summers uh, after that, in 1988, <clears throat> I started a few more chapters, little by little. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the year before the textbook was printed was 1998. One, okay. uh, the book was finished 1992 and printed 1993. The summer 1992, uh, mm -hmm. yes, 92. Mm -hmm. My daughter Margarita was already one year old, a few months, and uh, I spent. <laughs> don't, don't laugh at me, but no, I spent, never laugh at you. I I, I spent the whole month of my summer vacation in the basement <laughs> of my summer house just to make the titles to all 1,500, I don't know, uh, pictures. Pictures, yeah. it, took, it took me the whole month just to write the titles of the legends of the books. At the end of the month, uh, be, being uh, all the month in the basement, I had no tan on my skin. I was white like the first day when I arrived. <laughs> so I went to do some shopping in the supermarket of the village, and the lady asked me, Doctor, what happened to you? Are you sick? <laughs> I, just, I just was white with no suntan at all. But <laughs> this is <clears throat> just to, to give an idea. So finally, in 1993, the book was uh, ready, <clears throat> published, and I was very proud. Then later, uh, around 2000, and to 2003, I realized that in the meantime, so many things happened uh, that my book was already obsolete. Really? Mm. Uh, for instance, um, you mentioned before Gary Carr. Well, in, as you know, in my big Italian volume, okay, there's no chapter about surgery. And the reason is very simple, that um, I bought the very first ultrasonic uh, machine Union uh -huh. uh, was at the European Society meeting in 1991. Was in um, in Cannes, okay. And I remember that at the exhibition there, I bought this ultrasonic unit and the ultrasonic tips to start making my um, uh, retro prep with ultrasonics instead of using birds. So in 1992-93, I already I didn't have so many beautiful cases with the long term. Uh, recall evaluation. And I didn't want to publish a, a chapter already obsolete because only my cases, all of my cases were made with the round burr and the amalgam. I said, forget it. And that's why there is no surgery. But then uh, later, 2002 more or less, I had the idea to uh, update uh, the book. And I think it was your suggestion. That Mine? Yes, you suggest me. Uh, because I had too many <laughs> chapters, and uh, by the time the last chapter was ready, the first one was already obsolete. And so <laughs> you told me, you told me, start publishing what you have ready now. And so here comes my new edition of the of the English textbook Endodontics in three separate volumes. Ah, okay. But you gave me the idea. Don't waste your time. Don't wait too much. You have the first 10 chapters ready, publish the first 10 chapters, and this is what I did. That's so 2004, amazing. I published up to, uh, from embryology to access cavity and uh, pretreatment. And then the second volume came out maybe a couple of years later, starting mm -hmm. from uh, instrument and all the tactics about uh, cleaning, shaping, and obturation. And then uh, 2008, more or less, the last chapter, of course, with uh, surgery and all the other chapters, microscope, that were missing before. Now, 
I realized that in this uh, last edition, there is no CBCT. So I decided okay. I, need, I need to update, uh, hopefully <laughs> this will be the last one. Uh -huh. uh, I need to update my, my textbook. And so in the next edition, there will be also a very big uh, chapter on uh, CBCT, okay. where I explain how it works, all the advantages and many, many cases, uh, very, very interesting. I'm sure, I'm sure. Sandra, when he writes, what do you do? He's like buried in, he's in the basement turning white. No, no, he looks no, like no, Casper no. the ghost. <laughs> I don't go to the basement anymore. Oh, you didn't go to the basement. No, no, no. Okay. I, I organized my, my private uh, office in the summer house. Uh, in the in another in the, was was the guest room. room. Yeah, the guest what? Room. I'm sorry. You what? The guest room. Oh, the guest room. Okay. <clears throat> oh, no more guests. So I <laughs> no more guests. Guest. You're the guest. You're the guest. <laughs> Fantastic. My uh, I consider myself very very lucky. Mm -hmm. for two One because I'm still enjoying what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. if I had to, to to you know sometimes I go to sleep at night. Because I watch my, I take a look at my watch, I say, oh my goodness, it's almost one o'clock in the morning. And then, because I could keep going without realizing it's so late. And this is because I enjoy doing this. The other thing why I'm so lucky is because of the lady I have. Ah, nice. <laughs> Being a woman, she complains once in a while. Yeah, of course, he's a woman. And he never complains, right? You never hear him complain. But she oh. is the one who complains almost nothing compared to the other uh, friends and women and uh, and wives of my friends right. that I know. She's she's, she's special. She's oh, well, you have a very she's special lady. She's unique, and you have a a very special daughter, Marguerite. She's oh, the yeah. you know, and she obviously Sandra's the love of your life. But you have another love of your life, yes. your daughter. I mean. 50. I remember she was just, maybe she was a year old when we first met in the late 90s. She was probably still a baby, practically. She, right? was, she was born 91. 91, okay. So she, I mean, she, she was beautiful. I mean, really, uh, Sophia Loren, beautiful, right? <laughs> and so yeah. she, she's now an esthetician, okay? So you make beautiful inside, she makes beautiful outside. Exactly. And uh, she's not married, right? She doesn't have... Mm, not yet. <laughs> not yet. It's coming. It's coming. Okay. I hope. <laughs> Yo, okay. So um, now microsurgery, right? Okay. So how many years ago does microsurgery start? Well, uh, it started the day I installed the microscope in my office, which was okay. I also very well because was uh, the same year when we have the we had the EV meeting in Rome and uh, I placed my order at, uh, with Global in, and the microscope arrived the meeting was in July in Rome and the microscope in a big huge box came on September 95 so since September 95 I use the microscope every day and uh, to be sincere um, originally, uh, at the very beginning, I had to force myself to use the microscope because it was more time consuming. I was not used to it. But then the summer after uh, 1996, I decided to go to San Diego and take a course with Gary Carr right. to become more and more familiar with the, with the microscope. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you a funny episode. Sure. Uh, Gary Carr is a wonderful guy, a very good friend of mine, but he works in a different position compared to me. He works at 12 o'clock. Okay. And, and he is convinced that if you use the microscope, you have to work at 12 o'clock. Then I said, excuse me, but I've been in practice for already several years working at nine o'clock, sometimes 12 o'clock, but many, many times at nine o'clock. He obliged me during the workshop with the mannequin to work at 12 o'clock. Okay. I was going crazy. Thinking to go to the museum, I was going to the distal. Because okay. 
in a different position. All the perspectives is different. Through the mirror, you, you must force yourself to go what you think the wrong direction, which actually is the right one. So I finished my workshop and then I say, Gary, thank you so much. I learned a lot. But as soon as I went back to my office, I say, bye bye, Gary. I go back to my <laughs> nine o'clock <laughs> position. So what I, uh, when, I, uh, when I teach to my students, I always tell them, if you are very young and you don't have many years of experience on your shoulders, uh, okay, install the microscope, start working at 12 o'clock. That's the right position. But if you have been already in practice for many years, like I, I was at that time, don't change your working position because you, you go crazy. So work at, 12, at nine o'clock, keep working at nine o'clock at the microscope. Right. It's very, very easy. It's, uh, I mean, Gary Carr is uh, the father of modern endodontics, without question. Um, before Gary Carr, there was loops. Subsequent, we now have microscopes uh, all the way up to ProErgo. They're bringing in this Zumax from China. Um, he comes up with beam splitters. Uh, he starts teaching people how to do photography, TDO. So he really is in, you know, he's the, he's the Louis Grossman of the modern era, right? Everything changes when he starts. So what fascinated me about your book is you balanced um, the, like the modern, the contemporary, the future. And, and what I thought was amazing was you went to Hess, you looked at Hess's pictures in the late twenties. And so you had Hess's pictures and you had Arnaldo Castellucci, the exactly. same pictures. Exactly. Yeah, so, so how did this come about? I mean, you literally, the exact shape and whatever those things were called at the time, you have them in extras. How did you manage to do this? Oh, well, I didn't do anything special. I just apply what I learned from Herb Schilder at Boston University. Uh, the concept is the following, and this is something that I say when I, when I teach. Uh, we know very well that the anatomy is crazy, it's, it's bizarre, okay? Communication, lateral canals, extra canals, everything. And Herb Schilder knows, he knew very well that with our instrument, we negotiate and we clean the negotiable root canal. Right. We cannot touch the denting in all the other ramifications and so on. And so how do we clean and, and fill that space? Uh, many years ago, a guy from uh, Switzerland, uh, Angelo Sargenti, mm -hmm. in front of the crazy anatomy, <clears throat> say, don't worry, I give you a wonderful sealer who makes the miracle for you. We will mummify everything. And two, contain a part of all my diet. Mm -hmm. Well, Herb Schilder in front of the same <clears throat> panel, arrived to another conclusion. We clean and shape the negotiable canal. The other is not a shape, is cleaned by ir irrigants. Right. Okay. So, and the irrigant will digest everything. So if, then I ask myself, if this is true, I should be able to find in my post-operative film some or many uh, cases identical to the anatomy illustrated by Walter Hess 100 years ago. And so I went back to my post-operative films and I found many of them. Right. Some of them are exactly the same, like I was treating the nephew of Walter Hess. You treated the so, nephew of Walter Hess, really? It, it looks like the anatomy, it looks Exactly the same. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Oh, no, no, I realize, but it's the nephew. I see what you're saying. Okay. Exactly. So, uh, what I, I don't want to scare my, my students, but I say if you never find a, in your post operative film in, a, in anatomy the, uh, like the one described by Walter Hess, you are missing something. Yeah. Because that, that's anatomy. It's not just anatomy of Walter Hess 100 years ago. It's the anatomy of every single patient who comes to our office right. every day. Mm -hmm. So, and then I finished saying, let's assume that you have a very strange anatomy with a very curved canal and root, and you have to do the extraction. And during the extraction, you fracture maybe the last one or two millimeters of the root tip. What do you do? You leave it there or you try to remove it? 
and they, most of them, they say, no, no, try to remove it. I said, good. And now I, I, tell me why, if you want to remove the last one or two millimeters of the root, root apex in, in, into the socket, from the socket, why, when you do the root canal treatment, you want to stay one or two millimeters short? Okay. It's exactly the same. So our root canal must be completely uh, taking care of the entire system. Right. And, and if, if Herb Schilder was correct, saying that we shape what is negotiable and we clean the rest with irrigant, I must be able to find the same anatomy like Walter has. And I found it. Yeah. I didn't do anything special. I was just applying what I learned from Herb Schilder many years ago. So, so Herb Schilder is your mentor. You come into, you arrive in Boston in 1978. But Schilder, Dr. Schilder has written The Envelope of Motion in 1967. Yes. And you know he's, which is the father of nickel titanium. And all, it is. I mean, 1967, 25 years later, suddenly everybody wakes up and goes, "The envelope of motion, and the goddess is going to change." Exactly. And uh, so again, he's. It's the old story, right? You know, you're never a prophet in your own country. So he he's developing envelope of motion. Everybody else is using step back. Uh, exactly. Frank Wine is Washington Monument and all of the others. So it takes a while. So when he taught it, what, what was, when his students began to learn it, how did you begin to appreciate the difference? You it just, it made such sense, right? Because it basically allowed the canal, the, the root canal space to shape the file and achieve maximum cleansing. So exactly. how did you, how did you accept that? It was so different from what you were doing. It, what, did, when did you begin to embrace it? Well, uh, I told you that before, even before I went to Boston, I already had some training about the basic things from my Italian friend who already was mm -hmm. in Boston doing, having exactly the same experience like me. He spent uh, taking the continuing education courses and spending four months in the clinic. So I already knew something. And of course, when I was at Boston University for my four months, I, every single patient I, I treated, I discussed the treatment with the Ian Watson and Mike Weber. Mm -hmm. I was using their room. And then with the, um, the instructor uh, of the department. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, well, Herb Schiller came several times in Italy to give courses. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I was so lucky a uh, few years ago uh, to find the videotape that was made during his live demonstration when he was in Florence. Uh -huh. So it was, I remember very well, 1991. No, 1990. Okay, the year before my daughter was born. It was about November 1990. Uh, he came to Florence to give a course in a big auditorium, 1,150 people. Wow. Listening to him it was amazing. Mm. And I have the, um, uh, the guy who came with the TV equipment uh, to uh, record everything. Not only he recorded the, the two days of lectures, but also the third day he gave a, a live demonstration on a real patient that I provided to him. Okay. And I, st I still have the video. Wow. When I, I, when I, where he explained uh, very clearly, the ample of motion work using stainless steel, actually in his hands were carbon steel, pre-curved, large size reamer, and rotated in the withdrawal without making ledges or damages and everything. And after, uh, at the end of the presentation of the workshop, uh, no, actually it was a live demonstration, he showed the, the post-operative film was an upper premolar where everybody thought he was treating one canal but without saying nothing, he was treating both canals. Right, and of right. course, two canals, Ladala canals was a big applause from the big audience, it was unbelievable. Right. And so when I give lectures <clears throat> and I explain this angle of motion work, I use this video with the uh, shielder who is pre curved the instrument working uh, at that time without gloves. <laughs> uh, Okay, <clears throat> but, and 
you know that uh, many years later, or, or few, only a few years ago, uh, about seven years ago, uh, a very good friend of mine had the idea to motorize the envelope of motion work. And I'm talking about Mike Shanamblo. Right. Mike Shanamblo, for maybe 10 or 11 years, went back and forth to Balek in Switzerland with the engineer and uh, using prototypes, after prototypes. And then finally, in uh, December 2012, uh, I was invited to go to Miami. Uh, in December was a wonderful time because they were going to introduce, introduce uh, the new uh, Protaper Next. Right. Now, let me make a comment. I have no economical interest or on anything I'm, I'm saying now, but I am sincere. <clears throat> oh, uh, I tried this instrument and this, is, uh, the, the, this has been the time when I fell in love with this instrument because they are the motorization of the, of the movement. Right. That Archie they used to use and teach maybe 40 years ago. Uh, I selected an, an extracted tooth um, during the workshop, a lower molar with the double curvature, mm -hmm. uh, and see, let, let me check how this instrument behaves. And I couldn't believe my eyes. Right. Very fast and very safe, very easy, without blockages, without transporting, without anything. My Curve, my double curvature was perfectly shaped. Uh, the instrument remained perfectly centered. So that was December 2012. January 2013, for sure, all of my cases, all kinds of different anatomy, they are treated with the motorized envelope of motion work. And I'm very happy. So basically, the design of the protein for next was offset, uh, offset mass rotation, right? Exactly. Which in theory is what Dr. Schilder was doing. Uh, yeah, it's amazing that they came up with it. I'm sure the prototyping must have taken forever. But it's an, it's an exceptional instrument, certainly one of the most clever designs in nickel titanium. So that kind of brings me back to your journey. You've had, um, you have been, you graduated in 1981, you're an endodontist from BU. Uh, graduated is a is a too big word. I'm uh, I, I was there. I was not in the two year programs. I, I always want to clarify. Uh, I took the continuing education courses. I spent four months, and coming back from BU, I decided to limit my practice. After four years of general being general dentist, I decided to limit my practice to mm -hmm. endo. Uh, for several reasons, I hated the noise of the high-speed burr grinding a tool to put a crown. And I hated to sell, literally sell, the crown made by somebody else, the dental technician. Okay. I said, I want to be responsible for something that I do myself. And they weren't gonna purchase. I put it inside, inside the canal. Nobody's allowed to touch it. Oh, okay, okay, and, got it. Also, when, when I was already uh, taking uh, the continuing education courses at Boston University, going back and forth, I already had my teachers at the, you know, the, in Italy at that time, we didn't have the dental school. Dentistry was a specialty, specialty of medicine. Right. So after graduation in uh, uh, medicine, I took the three years uh, specialization in uh, general dentistry. So it's a ridiculous kind of specialization. However, when I was already, I was only uh, taking the continuing education courses, I already had my teachers at university sending me patient for endo. Really? Uh, be, starting being my referrals. So I mm -hmm. say, wow, I want to survive and live and be happy just leaving on referrals. And this is what I, I'm, I'm still doing. That's amazing. So Sandra, you were actually there at the beginning, right? You... No, 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 no. 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 San, Sandra came uh, later. Later. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. And came exactly 22 years ago. 22 years. Okay. Oh. So you've been his, you work in the office, you're the office manager taking care of <laughs> him. Okay. Make sure he eats on time and behaves himself. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So the, you have been in endodontics through every major milestone. 
apex locators, microscopes, nickel titanium files, cone beam tomography. Um, I'm not sure whether gentle wave, I know it's not available in Europe, but that's sort of like the next phase, if you will. Uh, Dr. Carr has embraced it. So let's go back to 1981. Okay. Uh, you start the practice. Uh, there are no nickel titanium files, no rotaries, and you begin to practice. So you're using uh, vertical condensation, warm gutta percha, probably Kerr pulp canal sealer at that time. Not probably, for sure, and for still sure. you. <laughs> okay, so you're, it's literally 10, well, the apex locator comes out. And how does that change your life in endodontics? Well, it was a big change. If you, if you come to my office and you go in my uh, <clears throat> big collection of all the charts of my patients, you will notice the difference the day before and the day after the episode locator. Because the treatment made before the episode locator, the chart is full of x-rays. And I, I used to keep, I don't throw away any, in, uh, the intraoperative film or any. Uh, oh, at, at that time, Herb Schilder told us to take a um, preoperative film, of course, then first instrument to the working length, last instrument to the working length, mm -hmm. con fit, deepest uh, compaction, and post-op. Now, in the molar, this was multiplied by the number of root canal. Right. You can imagine why the patients sometimes, they used to complain, doctor, so many x-rays, and then right. say, oh, yes, don't worry, don't worry. But w since the day uh, I have my root ZX, I have the preoperative -oper film, the con fit, because I can connect the APS locator, and the post op. Right. Once in a while, I took an intraoperative x ray because I have some doubt about the anatomy, the curvature, or today, and they got, I have the CBCT. Today, not only I take the intraoperative x ray, but I have cases when I take the intraoperative CBCT. Okay. Because when I have a very difficult calcified, uh, almost every week, almost, I receive a um, referral of a very calcified canal where the, the referring dentist uh, started to look for the canal without finding it. Uh -huh. But for most of the time, they stop on time. Some other times they make a perforation too late, but too late. I save it. And so they stop on time and they refer the patient to me. Very calcified canal. I start using the microscope, looking for the difference in color between the surrounding dentin and the calcified dentin. Still, it's not easy sometimes. And then uh, if I, I, I'm working and working and I can find it, I say, wait a second, before I make a damage, before I make a perforation, okay, let's take a CBCT. Take a CBCT and then uh, I see, oh, I was going too much to the distal, too much to the lingual. Back in the dental chair, in a few seconds, I find the, the canal. Right, right. Amazing. Big, big change. So the years go by. Oh, you were telling me you, um, you go to eBay all the time to find the original Root ZX. Yes. Right? Okay. <laughs> okay. That sounds amazing, right? You're the biggest purchaser of Root ZX on eBay. So time goes by, uh, Ben Johnson uh, and John McSpadden are working with nickel titanium, uh, developing nickel titanium, Johnson City in Tennessee, I think it is. Uh, they go to the manufacturer and voila, you know, the U-shaped nickel titanium, John uh, McSpadden starts coming up with Quantec. And so nickel titanium begins. So, what was your journey like with that? It was obviously different to, you know, shoulder envelope of motion was not uh, nickel titanium files at the beginning. No. Ground plate, uh, ground files, not twisted or whatever. So what happens when it comes out? What do, you, what do you do in terms of embracing it? Well, I started immediately to use uh, the new nickel titanium files. Originally, I started with Profile 04 because we, we felt the necessity to have a file with a bigger taper. The O2 taper required too many recapitulation, was too right. time consuming, and it's not, not so easy to recapitulate without making ledges, the stainless steel, rigid and aggressive uh, files. Mm. So I started with the um, 
profile of four, and then profile of six, orifice shaper, and then I fell in love with the GT rotary files from my friend Steve Buchanan. Right. I, those files make a big improvement years ago because we're using those instruments. Not only we could know the working length, not only we could know the size of the foramen, but finally that was the first time we could know the taper that we right. developed right. inside the canal. So if we finish with an uh, 2008 taper, you have to select the 08 taper cut aperture point. Right, right. Before the day, uh, if you came uh, and watched me working during the um, confi, I had to try and try and try one cut aperture point, fine, fine, medium, medium. I could consume, use maybe three or four before I found the, the right one. Yeah, with yeah. the GT rotary files, everything became so easy because you finish with a, with a you know, 8K file, I mean rotary, uh, GT rotary, and then you select the corresponding cut aperture point. Right. You cut it at the tip, 20, 30, 40, depending on the side of the frame, but there is no waste of time and no waste of other cut aperture point. Uh, and then, little by little, uh, I tried also Proteop Universal, kind of too much aggressive in my opinion. And so I used to combine Protaper in the Corona two thirds and GT more delicate with the um, uh, radial lens, <coughs> more delicate in the apical curvature. And then finally, I found the uh, Protaper next. Yeah. And now, that's it. That's it. So far, I'm not moving. Uh, you also go through, an, this all changes everything. Mm -hmm. You used to take a little, little tiny piece of gutta percha, put it on a hot instrument, put it in, and condense. And suddenly, we have thermoplastic gutta percha to do backfill. We have uh, system B. Uh, and suddenly, the compaction is not a heated instrument, but it's heated by a machine that controls it, and so you get your down pack, and now you're back. So with Shilder, obviously, you were popping lateral canals, look like a, a Christmas tree. Exactly. So suddenly, Dr. Buchanan comes up with System B, and how does that change what you're doing? Well, <clears throat> uh, I, I like it. I, it's faster. Uh, you develop more hydraulics, because not only you condense at the uh, in front of the plugger, you condense thanks to the wedging effect of the taper of the uh, warm plugger. So it's a big advantage. Uh, I remember very well another funny episode when uh, Steve Buchanan came to Florence to give a, a course. He gave a course uh, in a nice <clears throat> hotel room. I think it was the same hotel where you gave the course together with uh, Gary Glassman when you came to Florence. And then um, I organized a workshop for a gr small group of, of people in my facility. So everyone was invited to bring an extracted tooth with an access cavity already made, and they can now negotiate it with the number 10 KFI, file, not more. And during the workshop, they were asked to clean a shape with a GT rotary files and then use the system B. One dentist, a lady uh, that I met several years later and uh, during another lecture in, uh, in another town and she said, oh, the one you mentioned before, it's me. So she told me that she forgot the day before to prepare the tool to bring for the workshop. So in the middle of the night, she went to the, to the office, she took a molar, make a very strange access cavity, and then she came with that tooth. Now the access cavity she made, she opened the tooth, but she left almost completely the roof, the roof of the front chamber. <laughs> she just made the little hole next to the orifice of MB1, okay? And then during the workshop, she clean a shape MB1. Then she used the system B, and you shouldn't see the face of, of uh, Steve Buchanan. He was happy like great <clears throat> because she was able to fill the entire pop chamber, one third of the distal, one third or two thirds of the palatal, MB1 and MB2 
without any extrusion from MB1. MB1. Wow. <laughs> this is just to give you the idea of the hydraulics that you can develop. That's amazing, isn't it? So you also started using uh, Endovac, I think you were lecturing on Endovac at one point yes. in time? Yes. I, that, changed, that changed irrigation? Yes. Uh, honestly, I, I don't use Endovac in uh, uh, every single case <clears throat> in the way it should be used because, as you know, the, the, the little suction tip is the 0.32 in diameter. Right. That means that your foramen must be at least 30 yeah. or 35. Right. Well, not always is possible to have no. such a, a large foramen uh, unless you transport or destroy the anatomy. <clears throat> so when I have in a, a, um, an apex large enough to accommodate the tip, then I use it the way it should be used. Okay. Otherwise, I go as deep as I can, but not to the working length. The cases where I use the most are open epices. Really? Uh, oh, yeah, for sure. Big resorption. Right. And then I don't even use the, the metal uh, micro tip. I use the plastic one because the foramen is so large that uh, those are cases where there's nothing to shape, but you have only to spend your time with irrigation. And with the endovac, I position the little suction tip right at the foramen. So I have a continuous circulation of irrigants for uh, all the time I need to, to clean and I'm very, very satisfied. I remember I was, uh, before we get into cone beam, you were doing surgery, like nobody saw how you were doing it. You'd pop a lateral canal, there was a lesion, you came in and did surgery from the side of the root, not from, you know, not from the apex. Yeah. So you were, you know, you were retro sealing uh, lateral perforations, lateral canals, literally from the distal or proximal of the roots. And so yeah. people would look at this and go, well, okay, but it changed everything, right? It's like you know, it, it was almost a precursor of resorptions and how you clear up resorptions. It sort of set the tone for how you did that. So suddenly, um, CareStream brings out the 9000 CBCT, there's Plan Mecca, there's Serona, there's Acteon, and you embrace cone beam tomography because obviously that's. Where ended on is that right now? I, I am just sorry that I took my decision uh, late. I mean, I wish I had the decision taken <laughs> uh, years ago. Mm -hmm. My decision to install the uh, CBCT was maybe four years ago. Okay. And if you want, I can tell you why it took me so long. Well, first of all, I was looking for a CBCT working with Mac. I hate PC. And most of them, they work with PC. Jay Morita, for instance, is the best probably, but he works with the, with the uh, PC and I hate it. You hate uh, PCs? Well, you don't like Bill Gates? You don't know like Bill Gates? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I found Plameca worked with Mac. Right, right. And the quality is, is not maybe excellent like Jay Morita, but it's pretty good. Right. And I'm very happy. The second problem was the, mm, to find the room in my, in my office. Right, right. My office is very, very small. One centimeter is, is important. <laughs> right. So I found a, a little, on the corner, a little place where a machine needed only one meter in diameter uh, it was enough. I said, well, I put it here. And so, well, to be honest with you, there was another concern. And the concern was the big investment. Big right. investment on one side and my age on the other side. <laughs> so I said, at my age, I, I, am I sure to make such a big investment? And then I look at my face in the mirror and I say, yes. Uh -huh. Because you cannot go to a, an, an endo meeting mm -hmm. where everyone shows picture about the CBCT and we know how useful and how many information we can get. So. As long as I am strong enough to wake up in the morning and go to my office, I will keep working because I am I enjoy working on right. on patient. Right. So I don't care about the investment and I don't care about money. Mm -hmm. I found the the place. I found the one who works with Mac. That's it. And so I have it, and I I'm very happy. I have it. 
you, you also continue to publish in Zero Danta. Um, I was talking to Marco Ferrari the other day. And uh, Zero Danta, because of the people who are doing it, there's research. It's an amazing group of people. Uh, forget what he said in terms of the numbers. It's an exceptional number of people. Yeah, they, they have a big, big, huge number of followers. Huge number of people. And you publish it. So obviously that journal matters to you. You're not publishing and stuff, you know, there are Facebook pages and forums and this, that, and the other, but you publish a lot in Zero Danta. What was the reason for that being your choice? Uh, I don't like to, to publish on uh, Facebook because in Facebook you post a, a case uh, and then uh, people, oh, nice, nice, nice. And, I see that people who post on Facebook, they post it just to congratulate one to the other. Right, right. But, uh, and sometimes there are nice cases. Some of the times I see cases treated without the rubber dam. My goodness, no possible. Yeah, no possible. yeah, yeah. So face, I mean, Zero Dotto, I know very well the guy who is taking care of this is uh, um, called Fabio Cozzolino from Naples. He's the one who started Zero Dotto. And so I published several times, uh, not just posting a case, but... Uh, Very I, well documented, beautifully documented. Yes. So yeah. that's why. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Sandra, before we go, I'm gonna ask you the last question, okay? okay. Um, you have an amazing relationship. Um, so rather than asking Ronaldo, I'm gonna ask you. Hmm. What's, what's the next five to 10 years of your life look like? What is, uh, <laughs> what's your plan in terms of moving forward? Uh, you know, he still practices. He's, he takes his students to uh, Ponza in the summer so that everybody can be a family. But, you know, what, what do you want for the next 10 years? What, what's going to matter to you in terms of the next five to 10 years? So that, I mean, other than moving to Polynesia, um, where do you see him, uh, Arnaldo? Like, is he gonna slow down? Is he going to just step back? But what do you want to happen in the next 10 years? In uh, terms of where, uh, I'm putting her on the spot. This is not nice. I, I'm very curious to hear the answer. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay, so in the next, let's say five years, okay? Not 10, that's a long time. In the next five years, what do you want for you and Arnold? Well, maybe the same life, exactly. like today, like the same life, because now it's very, uh, we, mm, we feel good serenity. Is yeah. It? yeah. When you have the serenity, you have, I think. You have everything. I love you. <laughs> I, I hope, I, I was hoping, I hope no, she will say, I like the way we are now no, and we continue to be like no, this. The first is um, health, of course. Be yeah. health. Be health, yes. First thing is very, very important. And that's life. Just being at peace, being serene, like being in the moment, which is what you've yeah. always done. You know, you yeah. saw the future, but you worked in the moment. Yes. And the two of you obviously ground each other very much. So I want to thank you for this. Uh, a lot of things I did not know. Uh, you're one of the giants in endodontics, Arnaldo, but incredibly humble. You know, it's not like no ego. You just do what you do. You do it to share, to teach. And, um, you know, the contributions of your textbooks. And uh, you're very passionate about what you do, which is amazing. May I say something more? Absolutely. So <clears throat> you understand the, uh, my way of thinking. I love to document my cases and I love to teach. And when I teach, I don't keep any secret for me, but I, I say exactly what I do in every single, every single day. So years ago, I had one student who came to my office watching me working. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, at the end he said, doctor, but you really do the exactly the same things that you tell us when you teach. I said, of course, yeah. I can do one thing and teach another thing. And let me tell you one more thing. I, didn't, I will never forget the very first meeting of the European Society of Endodontology, where I was gonna organize in Italy, 
And uh, the president at the time was the same guy I mentioned you before, Giorgio Lavagnoli, the one who brought Shield in Italy. Mm -hmm. Okay. He was the president and I was the secretary. And the meeting was in Venice. I gave there my very first lecture in English, and I was very nervous and very excited. And the, the title of my lecture was um, Diagnosis. Very easy, okay? At the end of the lecture, one of the founder of the European Society from France, uh, I will not mention his name. He disappeared, however, I don't know where he is now. He came to me and he said, Dr. Castellucci, be careful because you gave a nice presentation but be careful because if you explain things like this, <laughs> then people will understand. I said, what do you mean? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay. Unbelievable. So I keep doing this so people understand. And you do it phenomenally well and you will continue to do this. Um, the two of you are amazing. I love the fact that you are, uh, there's harmony. I I'm watching the two of you. There's. Um, it's like a melody that flows between you two. It's the, it's the same melody, but you're both singing it, which I think is amazing. I'm going to say goodbye because I'm going to be uh, uh, talking to uh, Gurgli Benyuk about guided endodontic, static guided, because that's sort of the next phase. Uh -huh. And I want to talk to Henny Unzi because he's looking at bioactive substances and he's going to be involved in the next generation okay. of instruments. Give so, me my best regards, I know. I will, I will. It was del delightful. I, I really enjoyed talking with you and Arnaldo. As always, I learned zillions upon zillions of things. Thank you so much. Thank Have a you. good day, enjoy. And I would hug you both, but there's a computer, there's a Macintosh <laughs> in the way. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, my friend, be well, be Thank well. You. Thank you. Thank Ciao. You.